I would like to take a moment to highlight a truly unique way to experience folklore that I was recently introduced to. The Craft is a mystery puzzle game for lovers of folklore and myth. It combines incredible tales, as well as engaging puzzles and ciphers that you must solve to reveal mysterious occurrences, uncover otherworldly activities, and explore deep and fascinating stories from around the world. In these games, you help Lydia Law, director of the Centre for Research and Archives of Anecdotal Folk Tales, otherwise known as Craft, as a field agent exploring the unknown. There are currently 12 different adventures to choose from, and you can explore them all at www.madmenandheroes.com. Hello and welcome to the Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. Today, we travel through time and space as we examine the ways that folklore is represented in the long-running classic British science fiction TV show, Doctor Who. My two companions in the TARDIS on this trip are Will Hadcroft and Gareth Preston. Will is the author of the Android children's fiction series, His autobiography, The Feelings Unmutual, is a highly rated account of his growing up with undiagnosed Asperger's syndrome, a condition he finally discovered thanks to an article in Doctor Who magazine. Will has written the forthcoming BBC Doctor Who audio original adventure, The Resurrection Plant. Gareth is a freelance writer, occasional actor, and producer of the Very British Futures podcast. He started writing science fiction fanzines in the 1980s and since then has written for radio, film and the stage, as well as a large collection of online and print articles and reviews. Gareth and Will joined me for what turned out to be an in-depth look at the nearly 60 years of Doctor Who output. So, let's get straight into the interview. We are today going to talk about the way that folklore and mythology and legend has been represented over the many, many, nearly 60 years of Doctor Who. Um, so the, the the premise of Doctor Who, obviously, most people will be aware of, but it is a, you know, a, a British-born science fiction series which um, can really take in anything due to its main character being able to travel through both space and time. But obviously in the early days of the BBC, the remit for programming was was it not to educate to inform and to entertain and science fiction was very much frowned upon wasn't it at that time mm-hmm. i'd say definitely doctor who was originally envisioned by its creator sydney newman as being a program that was going to inspire children to learn more about science and history which is why he originally travelled with a science teacher and a history teacher. Uh, but very quickly, uh, some these monsters called the Daleks came along and very quickly it shifted into much more of a adventure series rather mm. than a... And although that kind of educational side of Doctor Who pretty much stayed with it as a theme during the 60s. Mm. Is it not true also, Gareth, that... Um... Whenever they did a science fiction story, the ratings, the viewers, the viewing ratings went up. And then when they did a historical one, they dropped again. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's partly the reason why eventually the, the historical theme stories petered out. I think that certainly became the case. By the time Patrick Troughton was the, uh, was the doctor, the historicals were very deliberately phased out as being less interesting to those modern swinging 60s kids uh, <laughs> than, uh, yes, we wanted, yes, more monsters and drama and less meeting famous historical celebrities. 
but but let, let's let's start though with with the the meeting of famous historical celebrities or or at least looking at kind of real world mythology if mm. you like as well well what what was the first story that we come across where where mythology was really represented as part of the doctor who universe I don't know whether it would be the myth makers, the William Hartnell story. Because I, I know, obviously, Greek legend is also history. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's, it has its roots in real history, isn't it? You know, the Battle of Troy is, is something that really happened. But it's become legend, hasn't it? It's become mm. mythical. Many a movie has been made about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, one of the great things about the myth makers is it very much addresses that gap between sort of historical reality, for want of a better word, and the legend. In that we we find that most of the Greek heroes in that story are rather wanting, in one way or another. They're all Odysseus is basically a crook who's out for himself, and Achilles is a vain rather pompous kind of posh guy and uh, <laughs> and similarly. Uh, so it actually plays with that. And originally the Doctor, because the Doctor's been challenged to break into the impregnable city of Troy, so naturally his companion Stephen says, well, what about the horse, obviously? And the Doctor goes, oh, no, that's just some ridiculous invention of Homer's. Yeah. And... Uh, but uh, but ultimately does end up having to suggest the, the horse by the end. So so yes, in the early days it was more foreign cultures and their folklore that we were going into. In Marco Polo, there's one episode that gives about ten minutes over to the recitation of a Chinese legend, mm-hmm. for example, and the Aztecs. They are you've gone into the Aztec culture and yeah. their sort of. Uh, I don't want to get too good in mixing folklore and religion and relationship, but it's that crossover with yeah. the Aztecs. And then later on in the 60s, increasingly, uh, the more fictional version of history begins to creep in. It becomes more about pirates appear twice in the later <laughs> years, for, for example. And uh, it's suddenly it's more, it's that kind of over the top Victorian art. Victorian kind of characters, mm. and and the series just go back, doesn't it, and and revisits ideas of of Greek myth in later iterations as well. Maybe, yeah. Mm-hmm. That, there are a couple of times in the in the Tom Baker era, aren't there? That I'm thinking of like Underworld, mm. uh, which isn't a very highly regarded story, but it it does mess around with Greek mythology. Um, the quest for eternal life and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of... Uh, yes, that was a striking thing about the Graham, uh, the producer, Graham Williams, who took over from Philip Hinchcliffe. Mm. Uh, Philip Hinchcliffe had over- overseen the early days of Tom Baker, and it's very clear that his influence is Hammer and movies. And yeah. perhaps, and in fact, it's funny, there were, when I was looking, we were... I was putting together a list of stories to talk about. There's quite a few stories that on the face of them look quite in this area, folkloric. And then you realise that really it's all just pure cinema. There's no deeper research than mm. than that going on. Mm. So uh, and then Graham Williams comes along and Graham Williams is much more interested in literature. He's, mm. uh, he's inspired much more by legends and fairy stories and these kind of, uh, and indeed in in folklore, so it's it becomes a theme of quite a lot of his stories. So is it a, is it the case that it depends very much on the writer or the producer at the time as to how well or otherwise the subject is dealt with? Mm. To some extent, that is down to the writer and how much research they want to want to do basically. Uh, some writers, I mean, it's a sign of good writing. You should do research. You should, where, and in often cases, they are inspired by a particular story, like uh, the the, Flan, the mystery of Flan, the ballad of Flan and Isle, which turns into the lighthouse set 
horror of Fang Rock, for example. Uh, but uh, yes, there are, then there are other writers who very much just use other people's fictions and mm. build a Doctor Who story on that. Doctor Who's a, a, a real magpie for nicking other people's uh, ideas. Mm. That Terence, in fact, the script editor, uh, Terence Dix, once said that. He said that the thing you need for a Doctor Who story is a good idea. It doesn't necessarily have to be your idea. <laughs> <laughs> also some writers have their own uh, preoccupations they uh, barry letts notoriously he was the producer of john pertwee's time he he was notoriously uh, investigating zen buddhism so buddhist mythology not in a very heavy way but it, it, it does creep in certain themes and ideas mm. that 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 barry was uh, keen on or that was he was considering he would weave them in sometimes into stories well definitely into the stories he wrote himself uh, under various pseudonyms but also into other people's stories if, if he could see that they lended themselves to that kind of thing so whilst it wasn't preaching buddhism or exploring uh, a doctrine as such that the ideas were there in a, in a number of stories in his time now that's interesting because it religion is not something that's that's dealt with particularly because it's it, in a program like this it's it's a bit of a tricky subject to be able to to weave into a story so so it's interesting that that one did kind of make the cut if you like yeah it is interesting in the Pertwee era it says very much a series that's dominated by science and in, mm. the doctors forever going to industrial complexes or laboratories in that uh, during his time and then suddenly in the middle of that you get this explosion of sort of folk horror in mm. the middle of it all with the demons yes mm. and we should concentrate on the demons as you've brought it up we'll do it now um mm -hmm. because that is probably in most people's eyes one of the classic stories as far as ideas of landscape folk horror as you say Mm -hmm. paganism magic mm -hmm. those sorts of ideas come about can you just summarize for people who are not so familiar with it what the plot of the demons actually is okay it is set there's an archaeological dig and they're about to go into what they believe is the barrow of a, a dark age king of some kind of bronze age i believe king uh but is when they break into the barrow, huge supernatural devastation seems to strike the village. And meanwhile, the doctor's arch enemy, the master, is pretending to be the local vicar in a mm. rather lovely sort of like just juxtaposition. And he's on and he, knowing what's really in the barrow, has arrived to take advantage of this alien being. That is actually, it turns out there's an alien being actually buried under this barrow. And a lot of what we think of as magic is actually, and indeed our traditional view of the devil turns out to be, have a direct alien influence by this race of aliens who we call the demons. That's that, that sort of thread. It comes up in a few other stories, isn't it? The idea of, of uh, an alien presence. Uh, being a direct link to our understanding of what the devil is, like the malice in the awakening Peter Davison story, where mm. somebody actually sees a, a picture, not a picture, but um, so, so something inscribed on a wall, and she says that's a representation of the devil, and she actually says it. Um, and then the doctor has to link it up with the malice that what people in 1600 and whatever it was thought, thought was the devil was actually this alien force um, deliberately stirring up uh, negative uh, emotions and vibes so that it could feed off the, the psychic energy. It, it needed them to enact a, a war so that it could feed off the hatred and all the negative emotions. So, so those kind of ideas crop up every now and then. But what, mm. what I would also say, because we're saying, Gareth, about science, uh, being brought in quite a bit more heavily in the John Pertwee era. 
than, than previous eras. The Doctor really was a scientist in the John Pertwee era. Mm. Um, that every time something that is seemingly magical or spiritual or religious, they, they then go and do a Scooby-Doo on it and say, well, actually, no, and un unmask the real enemy. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and it turns out not to be magical, and it's not uh, anything to do with spiritual encounters. You know, it, it is all material, physical, and mechanical. It's all boiled down into a sort of materialist and secular viewpoint at the end. Mm. Is there a particular reason for that, do you think, in that era, that they, they choose to discount magic and just go, it's science? I think it's just, just a general mood of the programme. It's a general mood in most science fiction. It's not just unique to Doctor Who. I mean, uh, Star Trek is full of gods being exposed as aliens yeah. or computers. Uh, I mean, the demon sets its stall out almost from the beginning. I mean, we start off with that mag marvellous nighttime scene of uh, this lonely do dog walker walking through this stormy night and being killed by something I'm mysterious. Mm -hmm. And then we go from that to the Doctor dis disproving uh, magic. So initially you get that sort of setting out, setting out of things that look like magic in fact are science and we later discover that uh in that that the a lot of the black magic is actually this demon's psionic they they are the stick a word in it they say it's psionics yeah instead which obviously makes it scientific you see how was the story received at the time because uh the bbc is putting out what is essentially a children's program when, mm. whether you agree with that approach to Doctor Who as a children's program or just as light entertainment, different people have different opinions on that one. But it is an early evening viewing slot. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and it's dealing it's with things. It's half past five on a Saturday, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So all the family are there. Yeah, all mm -hmm. the family are there watching a program which is dealing with themes of paganism, black magic, the devil. Yeah. A cult. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. How is that received at the time? I think there were some eyebrows raised. I don't think mm. not there wasn't as much outrage as perhaps there was over other bits of violence that perhaps are more imitate. I mean, children are more likely to imitate some of some of the violence rather than holding black magic uh Lots of uh, ceremonies at school, mm -hmm. but I mean, but certainly those the scenes with the master pretending he's he's built himself a little coven of uh, devil worshippers, we discover, and those scenes certainly they would look don't look out of place in a hammer at the time, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I think the most outrage was over the apparent destruction of the church. Yeah, which convinced some people that the, the BBC had actually blown up this church in Oldbourne for the sake of a, a TV programme, which uh, caused some harumphing letters to be written. <laughs> yeah. Testimony to the, the special effects of the time, because yes. it was mm. a model that they blew up, but people were, were convinced it was a real building. It's interesting, like, continuing this theme of, of science, of magic versus uh, rationality and science in the demons. Uh, early on, as I said, the, the master is pretending to be uh, a vicar. And early on, Miss Hawthorne confronts him. And he's saying about, well, you know, the soul, it's a very, do we really know what it is, really? It's more of a fear. And she, how dare, a rationalist, existentialist priest? I've never heard of anything so ridiculous. <laughs> And, and paganism, I guess, is, is, is covered elsewhere as well, isn't it? In other stories, this wasn't just a one-off. Mm, I mean, sometimes quite explicit, although it's not on the face of it, seemingly uh, a folklorist. The, uh, the face of evil is actually yeah, yeah. quite a... Because, because they've set it on an alien planet about ostensibly alien people, in a way, they feel the, the writer, Chris Boucher, thinks he can go further and it's it's actually quite a a harsh look at religion 
And then mm. this one says, this whole religion that these people believe in is entirely a mistake and a misunderstanding of what's actually happened yeah. uh, to this uh, these explorers who split so it's up. It's like in... Chinese whispers, isn't it? It's been, they, it's been passed down through the generations. Mm. That, and they they don't realise they're just descendants of people who crashed there. Absolutely. And the two societies split off a technical society and the uh, the survey team, who then become the Sever team. Um, mm. And all this religion is based around it. And they're, they're just all but it's entirely man-made, isn't it? And the whole thing is man-made and all their beliefs and uh, their, this made-up folklore on this planet about the evil one and all these rituals mm. they have. There's a, a little bit where um the, the doctor meets someone who does this sort of genuflection <laughs> when he sees him and the doctor says oh that's probably a sign to ward off evil isn't it which is funny that it's also the checking routine for a, a mark 7 spacesuit yeah pressing all the <laughs> buttons yeah on the side mm -hmm. yeah and, and doesn't one of them wear like a cricket glove or something on his head as a yeah. piece of religious attire um, that's, and that's supposed to be symbolising something, but it's just a glove from a spacesuit. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So, and but but Doctor Who's always held back from going quite that far with a, a real actual religion. I think it would, yeah. and I don't think they ever would. I think uh, even the, even though occasionally someone suggested, you know, why don't we do a, a Christmas special where the Christmas star turns out to be an alien spaceship, sort of like in Palestine yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 2,000 years ago. But I think that They're would be a mistake. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a kind of nod to that, wasn't there, in the um, in the rebooted version with, you know, the Christmas specials have, have had little nods to that kind of idea, the, the star-shaped mm -hmm. spaceship, but, but not in that context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the classic series... Sorry, Matt. In the no, no, no. classic series, uh, just thinking of the Stones of Blood, when you were talking about paganism in Doctor yeah. Who. No, I was just going to ask about that one, actually. Where they have um, people being sacrificed on stones on the moors and talking about the Kaliak. Uh, and, of course, it's really, again, manipulation by aliens. And you've, you've got these two stones from a stone circle that come alive and move across the moors and kill people. And I, I remember as a seven-year-old, I was scared to death of those things. <laughs> I mean, now mm. when you watch it, they look like they're rolling along on wheels with a with a, a light bulb inside flashing on and off. But when I was seven, they were terrifying. But but that mm. that whole thing of crows and ravens and uh, messages being passed secretly mm. and that, that's all that kind of pagan stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. But there's this idea, isn't there, of um, playing with our inherent fears is is behind a lot of these sorts of stories even i suppose looking at modern stories like blink and yeah. the weeping angels where you know you, you might have i suppose if you wanted to look at it in terms of folklore the closest you could get would be a, a you know the fact that it's kind of resembles a uh, gargoyles and that that you know yeah. that kind of aspect Church, churchyard yeah yeah statues, yeah yeah, mm. but but it plays on our fears of the ordinary, doesn't it? And mm. you know, it's what what's a statue is not a statue when you're not looking at it. The same, although it has mm. no no connection with folklore at all. But it's the same sort of thing with the the idea of the Vashta Narada and the fact that you know it's a, a shadow can be something that's damaging as well. Mm. And the autons again. This is not folklore, but the autons. The idea that when you walk past shop dummies in the window, did you see one of their heads turn yeah. as you walk by at the corner of your eye? You know, that kind mm. of idea of playing on. But the world is other than it really seems to be. Yes, yes. And, and that's where it does tie in, isn't it? Is it? It's the idea of the other being amongst us, I suppose, which, mm. which is um, quite common mm. in, a lot of, in a lot of folk tales. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you've both given examples I mean, although they're, they're made up, they have that kind of folklore structure. They are a monster with very specific rules to be followed. Mm. Uh, in, the, in, in either you don't look at the, or rather you keep looking, sorry, the other way around, you keep looking at the angels, mm. sort of like, and then you, 
you will be safe until you look away and mm. and similarly the Russian Narada come with with rules uh, and an interesting interpretation of that comes in tooth and claw which uh, on yep. one level it does the thing where a legend in this case a werewolf turns out to have an alien origin but there's i thought it was quite interesting this idea that the werewolf in that story it, which has been raised by this cult basically as a kind of weapon as, uh, as part of their plans and that they've trained this werewolf to believe in the werewolf myth mm-hmm. so it's, it doesn't so it sort of stays away from hawth there, there's a scene where they're in a library and the wood paneling is made out of hawthorn and the the werewolf even though it could easily smash in doesn't because it believes that you know hawthorn is deadly and mm-hmm. so which i thought that was an interesting use of of, of belief yes mm-hmm. yeah that lead, leads us into another area actually which, which we could explore which is the idea of these kind of real world cryptids or creatures or monsters um Mm -hmm. i mean the Loch Ness monster for example how many times has that been explored in the series in one way or another i know of two off the top of my head am i with gareth are there any more those are the two main ones you know i as a kid i absolutely loved the Loch Ness monster legend i i certainly believed it when I was young, I, I sort of believed in all the. I had the books, uh, the uh, and you know, I knew all those famous photos off mm. by off by heart, and uh, so it. So I was thrilled when the, the Loch Ness monster turned up in in Doctor Who. Uh, again, yes, they they deal in although. It's interesting. It's although it's a lot less monster, they don't really address the fact that it's Nessie until about halfway through the story. Yeah. First, it's just a mysterious monster. There's an interesting little bit of, of this is very writer. The writer is Robert Bank Stewart, very good writer. And there's an interesting playing with that kind of horror motif about the sinister past and the sinister folklore, because the innkeeper tells Sarah Jane this story because she's teasing him a bit over his he is a bit superstitious and believes in various things and she's teasing him a bit and he tells her this story there was a man who stayed at this very inn he went out on the moor and was never seen again and she sort of says oh when did that happen well it was 1946 (laughs) and then he says oh and then there were the jameson boys but that was a wee while ago which I always <laughs> thought was quite a funny line. That uh, that it turns out that's like nineteenth uh, century, and, mm, yeah. and it's uh, this little it's uh, one of those almost urban myth type things that they went on the moor and encountered something, and one died and the other. His hair turned quite white. Yeah, the result. <laughs> it's a great scene. That it's the way yeah. the actor delivers it and the incidental music in the background. It's very spooky, the way it's mm. presented. I think with with all of these folklorish things that's what they're aiming for in doctor who aren't they it's doesn't matter if it's accurate doesn't matter if it's based on something that really happened mm. or if it's completely made up or stolen from a movie mm. it if it has a spooky feel to it then they're on it mm. yeah and in a nice way in that story uh, the they end up in a way substantiating the legend of the Loch Ness Monster yeah. because uh, by the end of it uh, the creature which was only being used it wasn't inherently evil it was just being yeah. what it was it was monster. being directed wasn't it yeah yes by other the, an alien race called the Zygons and at the end they let it sort of swim back and live out its days in the Loch Ness Monster uh, and so the, the, by the end of it there really is a Loch Ness Monster and yeah which is great for the tourist industry if, and that, yeah. seems, <laughs> that seems come up elsewhere hasn't it the idea of the monster being the victim mm. and, and being misused misunderstood yeah yeah i'm thinking yeah. of the uh what's the the vincent and the doctor that creature that's supposedly a terrifying monster it turns out that it's blind mm. And, mm. and that it's not it's not actually going around attacking people because it's evil it's frightened 
Yes. Mm. Uh, and then there's a parallel made with Vincent's uh, bipolar disorder and okay. the way he seems to be sometimes and not others. Mm. Um, yeah, very mm. intelligent storyline there. So yeah, monsters as metaphors, and similarly with the the Yeti, the, <coughs> mm. which uh, seems to be at one point revealed that it's uh, actually their robots in disguise as Yetis, and mm. then at the end we discover there are real Yetis, and they're yeah. they're much from what we see of them, they seem much more gentle and nicer, and were mm. probably being. Yeah. Ter- terrorized by the although frustratingly we do not have a photo of what the real yeti looked like um mm. and no clear description of it or anything so that's a a little mystery in itself yeah, yeah and you, you were saying about two there are two Loch Ness monsters mm. i don't i don't know if will if you want to talk about <laughs> the other Loch Ness monster the other one yes mr <laughs> borad himself uh, in the time lash, yeah. So, so in the time lash story, there's um, a time tunnel on a planet far away, where, and they use it to uh, dispatch criminals. So they basically throw them into it, and they've got no idea where the other end of it is, uh, where they come out. And it turns out they come out uh, at Loch Ness, uh, and when the the villainous Borad, who's uh, a mutant, so he's got this sort of dinosaur face on one side and a human face on the other and a flipper for a hand and an ordinary hand. Um, he is uh, thrown down the time lash at the end. Uh, and Perry says, but won't he be seen? And the doctor just smiles wryly and says, from time to time, <laughs> referencing the uh, Loch Ness monster. Yeah. I remember, uh, it's funny with the um, Terror of the Zygons, where we all go, oh, it's a Loch Ness one monster. But uh, when time lash was screened, my, my entire family all went, oh. <laughs> when that revelation was made <laughs> that the Borad was a lot less small, so it was less convincing, probably because he's so much smaller. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just the size of an ordinary man, really, isn't he? Yes. So werewolves, there we go. There's one, the Loch Ness Monster. There's another one. Um, and vampires, that's another yeah. one that comes up a couple of times, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, what's this? Go sorry, I was just going to... Mm-hmm. Sorry, Gareth. Uh, Hold your thoughts, because I'm just backtracking a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just thinking about Terror of the Zygons, Mark, about shape-changing creatures. Is, is that anything to do with folklore? Yes, absolutely. Up... Yeah, yeah. the concept of shapeshifters is, is, yeah, is found in all sorts of different cultures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, mm. that had a loose, a loose root in folklore, just that very yeah. concept. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Good call. Yeah. That's it. And um, yeah, with vampires, uh, with Doctor Who, perhaps strangely not done vampires more in a way because they're such a, an obvious villain. Mm. Uh, the first, uh, in fact, the first vampire we saw was very quickly revealed to be actually just a, a part of a, a sophisticated ghost train, basically, uh, Count Dracula uh, yeah. back in the 60s. And we don't really get a proper vampire uh until state of decay with the yeah. and then it, they really double down and they bring in all the vampire law it's got bats and yeah i don't think they actually have garlic i'm trying to think if they actually have garlic i don't think they actually have garlic but uh yeah. it's very much hammer film inspired mm. uh the state of decay and, yeah very uh, theatrical looking isn't it yeah. Very, yeah, very factual, and the vampires, even if they're revealed to have an alien origin from an ancient enemy of the uh, the Time Lords, apparently, is where they originated from. Mm. But they're very in the sort of traditional, pale-skinned, aristocratic... Yeah, uh, yeah. bloodshot eyes, yeah, the teeth... The whole bit mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it's very much the stereotypical picture mm-hmm. isn't it but then in in the reboot we get um vampires of venice which which is a slightly mm-hmm. more horrific vampire i guess in some respects mm, they are and and uh, although again they toy with this because they start off with something that seems very much a traditional kind of vampire mm. we even because changing moors we we now have a few bosomy maidens as well in uh in venice but then it turns out they are in fact a hideous fish-like creature and not mm. vampires at all mm. by the end i was just thinking i hadn't thought of it when i listed it 
got the uh, the curse of Fenric, the Hemovores mm. uh, vampires, aren't they? And uh, I think they were originally called vampires. And John Nathan Turner said, "Oh, that will upset certain people in the audience." So mm. they were renamed Hemovores after hemoglobin. Yeah. Um, mm. Although that's that's only part of the story. There, there are other mythical things. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go, go into a bit more detail about the story of the Curse of Fenric, because it also is another one of those stories that kind of deals with our own historical cultures, notably, mm. I suppose, you know, Viking, Scandinavian cultures, mm. and then goes off in a different direction, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So it's, uh, it's set, Second World War, isn't it, Gareth, uh, that mm-hmm. period? Uh, North Yorkshire, is it? Um, and an army mm-hmm. barracks is involved, but it is all about a Viking curse that mm. uh, Dr. Judson is transcribing, translating into English. And they have a World War II cipher machine that they're using to crack German codes with. And they decide it wouldn't it be a great idea if we fed this Viking inscription into the cipher machine and see what happens. And of course, what happens is it unleashes the curse of Fenric, this e- this evil force. Um, quite how mm. the mechanics of that work, it's never explained. But in magical things, it never is, is it? You know mm. exactly what's going on. Mm. Is it can't be explained? That's why it's magical. Yeah, so see, there, uh, there is a certain like amount of uh, dream logic in in that story. But yes, it's certainly early on, it's very heavily into sort of folklore tropes. I mean, yeah. that one that Will's just mentioned, the the the, the inscription, the mysterious writing on the wall, mm. that, uh, that initially, before they discover it's actually a kind of computer program, initially mm. it seems to be a curse. In fact, it's an old story about how these Vikings mm. stole a cursed treasure and they mm. were killed off one by one by some nameless evil. So it starts, and so we are firmly into a much more super... And the way um, the, way the Doctor uh, and Commander Millington uh, read out portions of that uh, prophecy to do with the, the ash tree and all of that. And, uh, mm, and uh, Yeah, yeah. And I, I hope, I hope, my, yeah, I hope my wife will forgive my sin and all this kind of stuff, you know, very religious-y, very um yeah mythological and spiritual until mm. the more mechanical side of it comes in later on mm. and then in fact it uh, rather suggests at one point that the hemovores or rather this one particular creature called the ancient hemovore mm. the, the ancient hemovore mm. who was uh, like the originator he's the one who's created all the other hemovores and there's a suggestion that he actually created the vampire myth on mm. earth that uh, whilst traveling over the centuries and whilst he was passing through transylvania he creates this myth that bram stoker then uh, learns about later on mm. and it's very much a sort of sins of the fathers the and that it's all about the descendants of the Vikings have somehow carried this evil or this alien design with them, mm. which is something of a recurring theme. This uh, actually, this idea of an evil being passed down generations, mm. uh, aside from, of as well as the strictly supernatural kind of the cursed family kind of genre. Uh, in in science fiction terms, and again, they kind of took this idea way back from Quatermass in the Pit. This I with this idea of, which had this idea that Martians has imprinted something into human DNA, you know, mm. to carry on that 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 we were their legacy. But that's mm. probably a different podcast altogether <laughs> on that one. Um, so, Cousin Frederick is an example of that. Another good one. It's. Image of Fendal, which initially mm. seems like it's going to be very suitable to be talking about until, and it, it does have some elements in it. It's got a, a sort of wise woman, a sort of Earth Mother character, yeah, yeah. called uh, Mrs. Tyler or Mother yeah. Tyler, as some people refer to her, yeah. and she uh, does all these sort of folklorish uh, 
remedies that she she sort of sells to local the locals that uh, turn out to be a lot of them. Her her lucky charms actually turn out to be bags of rock salt. Yeah. That, old, that old legend about uh, you know the devil not liking salt and salt mm. being a protection, and in, because it's Doctor Who, this turns out to have some basis in alien science. And the Doctor is yeah. able to use the rock salt to defend themselves against the the hideous Fendaline, the slug like Fendaline, and uh, Curse of Fenric. Uh, Again, uses it a bit more subtly in this sense that this evil has somehow been manipulating generations of people to bring all the right elements together mm. at this point in this village so that this uh, it can be released. The doctor explains it in a very supernatural. He doesn't unusually for once. He he doesn't really give a very scientific explanation for what Fenric no. is. He sort of. He's, it's mystical, fact, it, isn't it? It is actually quite yeah. a mystical origin. He talks about that um, when the universe was created, it's uh, there's a there was an echo, the good and evil yes. and split apart, and Fenric is uh, an echo, an echo of the evil from the start. Somehow the, the evil escapes. Yeah, I can see him saying it. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then so, she says, and that's Fenric, and he says, well, no, that's just what Commander Millington calls it. But uh, the uh, evil itself has been around for as long as the universe. Which is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's this, ambiguous, isn't it, what it actually is. Mm -hmm. And this idea of ancient evil, I suppose, comes up elsewhere as well, doesn't it? Um, the, the Awakening is another story, well, I think, that, that has that behind it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We touched yes. on that a little bit before, didn't we? Sorry, Gareth. No, I was about to say, yeah, Will raised it, uh, gave a good uh, dis description of it earlier on. Mm. Uh, again, we're very much in that kind of sort of folk horror story telling yeah. with uh, discovering of mysterious carvings and uh, mm. yeah, it, it's called the, the Malice. Church. Now, I don't know mm. if you, you can answer this, Mark, because at one point the Doctor says, oh, the Malice, that's another word for the devil. Now, I don't know if that's true or something Eric Pringle made up. Uh, I, do you know? I'm not sure. I'd have to. Yeah. I'd have to check on that. It's, is it's it not, even, not is it even a real word? Is <laughs> malus spelled M-A-L-U-S a real word? Because I was a as a teenager, I thought they were saying malice. It was only oh. when I saw it written down, yeah, <laughs> that I saw it was malus. I'm looking it up because I don't have that off the top of my head. There is. Uh, there we go. There is a breed of apple tree. Oh. Malus domestica, which is the red devil. Ah, uh, interesting. So it, it probably comes from a completely disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> but, but, but still, yes, I guess relates to the devil. Though. So we we can yeah. give them that one. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Oh, I've, I've learned something. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> I, the idea of something evil trying to encourage evil in others. So that it can feed off uh, the destruction and the mm. killing and the and the fear and the anger. That that's a very potent idea, isn't it? And it works so well in that story. Mm. That, that um, this it, it doesn't even appear to do it. It's just there, this horrible face in, in, a, in a church wall, and yet it's um, psyching them up, literally psyching them up um, mm. yeah, to engage in war even down to the point where they're going to sacrifice uh, Tegan as uh, the May Queen or whatever it is that she was going to mm. be. But they were actually going to go through with it and kill her. So uh, it. And so it's we're... all because of this force egging them on to do it. Yeah, so that's drawing from, obviously, witch burnings mm. and and the like, that, yeah. that, that, that kind of legend and this idea of a, a whole community, that, that paranoia about rural mm. communities, mm. that they're all in it, all conspiring against you, which is a mm. recurring theme in quite a lot of uh, horror films. Yes, and... absolutely. While you're on the subject of witches, we probably ought to talk about the witch finders, which is mm. one of the most recent um episodes i guess being part of jodie whittaker's tenure and that's Ooh. an interesting one because that is based very much more in kind of decent historical background and and mm. as is the case with a few of the more 
recent stories perhaps it's it's focusing more on the victim side and the mm. actual real world horror behind these things in the same way perhaps mm. as as um rosa parks's story was was covered looking at that kind of victimization mm. aspect as well it's an interesting one the witch finders isn't it it is. I think it's a very interesting uh, story. As you say, there's several levels of, of victimhood. There's obviously the women, the innocent women, being persecuted as witches and that whole paranoia and mob mentality. And then mm. we discover that the person who's behind this uh, campaign, in fact, both people, both the local lady of the manor, who's become infected by another ancient alien the uh, evil and uh and the more historically true case of uh, king james the mm. first who f was well known as a uh he was witches were something of an obsession with yeah with absolutely him. and it's so uh, i think that that aspect is well covered in mm. that story by joy wilkinson and we're we looking to him so he's both a perpetrator but we sort of see because of his upbringing uh in a way he's, he's quite damaged in mm. some ways and that's but they do choose to use comedy or at least darker humor perhaps mm. um for the character of james the first don't they rather rather than focusing absolutely on the horror side which is an interesting choice Yes, I mean, how much of that was how Alan Cumming approached the part and says, mm. yeah, I'm going to go reasonably big mm. on this and make, although you get that nice contrast because for most of the time he's quite this energetic sort of, even though he's doing terrible things, he's kind of perversely mm. likable because he's so kind of upfront and energetic about his witch hunting mm. and and then we just see this that one or two moments where you see this more haunted uh tragic uh, character there is a lot of humor um i particularly like the the uh like graham is mistaken as the chief witch hunter because yes. he's a man obviously. yes yeah and uh and when they're challenging him about why he's letting these women sort of like come up with all the suggestions he is i love his lines sort of like it's a very flat team structure, which I thought was uh, a, a nice bit of humour. That, mm. but it, because it's the witches, there are, you feel there's certain things you've got to have in it. You've got to have a ducking stool in it somewhere because mm -hmm. that's what people think about when they think about witch hunting. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, some of it's kind of uh, primary school lessons, isn't it? You know what what mm -hmm. what you would have been taught in primary school mm. about witches and how they were treated. They have to stick that in there. Uh, mm. because that's what most people will remember about that situation, things they've learned in childhood, mm. and they've stuck with them. So the, it, it's like, well, a, a number of doctors who's like, this isn't folklore, but um, the visitation, the, the Great Fire of London, the plague. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's clear that Eric Sayward went off and got a kiddie's book on that part of history mm. and then wove a Doctor Who story around it. And that... They do that with these kind of witchcraft type theme stories. I was just mm. thinking, just I don't know if this is off topic or not, but it's kind of a going off on a little slant of the the Shakespeare Code, the Gareth Roberts piece, mm. yeah, where uh, it's kind of uh, magic and witches, but it's done instead of it, it's, uh, the spells instead of them working the way they do normally. It's it's all to do with um, usage of words to to create situations and generate something, isn't it? Mm. So so mm. rather than I think I think it, the idea there was because uh, you do have witches in it and you have like voodoo dolls, but they're kind of pieces of technology. You've got that thing again of science versus religion and mythology being explained in a scientific way, mm. and then the the idea I think the author's idea was that as we talk about mathematics being used, uh, the relationship between energy and matter and mathematics, you can create things. Thinking like in Logopolis now, where you can literally create something using mathematics. I think he applied the principle to the use of words. And mm. that's 
and that was an explanation of how spells work. Mm. That that it's not just people coming up with particular rhymes, um, and then something happens. There's some science behind it. Um, very loosely explained again, but an interesting way of putting it mm. across. Mm. Yeah. The spells are actually driven by the words themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a nice bit of dream logic thinking. It's satisfying yeah. within the storyline, you know. Yeah. It, you, you don't want to look too closely into it, but uh, yeah. for the purposes of the story, it it works. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's that whole thing about names having power. Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, uh, a running theme actually in the tenth doctor stories this idea that if you know the name of an alien it mm. sort of gives you some power over it when mm. the doctor names something it seems to give him power there's perhaps boss explicitly said when uh in a in a twelfth doctor story the flat flatliners well, not flatliners. That was a, that was the film with Kiefer Sutherland in, it was. Uh, in <laughs> yes in in Flatline when he says yeah. uh, I ne he, he says he so you have chosen to be monsters and I name you ah, you know I was building up there and I can't remember now what he named well, whatever it was they named it that yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sorry that one went off in. <laughs> Um, a, a couple of other things that come to mind, I'm conscious of the time, but I think there's a couple of other areas that come to mind. One, one is um, other literary legends that have come up. So um, certainly the Arthurian legend is explored in mm. Battlefield, which, which, which is one that we haven't got. And also what came to mind while we were talking about um, more recent stories just now is, of course, in, in the Peter Capaldi era, we do have Robin Hood popping up as well, don't we? Yeah, mm. yeah in fact, that takes us back to the myth makers that we were talking about at the beginning, mm. because it's another deconstruction type story, and that uh, Robin Hood turns out uh, to be not quite what the legends are. Although it's a, then it, but then it kind of goes into why we need stories, and indeed why we, why Robin Hood as a story has lasted so so long, through his many changes over the over the centuries. Mm. It's an invest, it becomes an investigation of what you know the power of the story of a man who stands up for the uh, the downtrodden and this this hero. So. Uh, but it, and the Doctor's annoyance that this particular version seems to be largely based on the Errol Flynn movie and everyone's <laughs> being very jolly and macho and thigh slapping. Yes, which, which of course is what all heroes were like. Obviously, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how is uh, how is King Arthur represented in Battlefield? Mm. So you have the Knights of the Round Table and all of that, don't you? Uh, and it's, Merlin mm. and. Mm -hmm. And it's the the once and future king, and that uh, Arthur himself doesn't appear. Yeah. Uh, he he's dead, and uh, in fact, there's a lovely line near the near the end where the Doctor picks up a note that turns out to be written by himself from the future, yeah. where it says, "King Arthur killed in the last battle. All the rest propaganda." Which, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And there are again. It's uh, it's enjoying playing with the tropes of the Arthur with knights, with bold knights, and evil knights, and, and the uh, sword and chival and the sword. Although that's a good example because we get this moment of the sword rising out of the lake, yeah. carried by Ace in this time, and Ace being, and then she kind of just sort of tosses it to Ansley and say, "Here, yeah, you can be king of England." Yeah. Uh, so again, it's all a bit diffused by it. Uh, so again, it's another example of a, a folk, uh, a folklore being inspired by aliens. Yes. Or... Yeah. I just, I just thought. So, sorry, Matt. Go on. No, no. I was going to say, which, which is natural for for what is inherently a science fiction show that that mm -hmm. most of the representations are going to have a kind of alien spin to them, aren't they? Let's be honest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, we can't. We can occasionally we get a bit of ambiguity. Uh, at the end, when the Doctor encounters a creature that calls itself the devil in mm. the Satan pit, yeah. Yeah. And at the end, they say, when somebody says, you know, did we meet the devil? And the Doctor goes, well, I don't know, really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know everything. 
<laughs> Will, you just thought something else as well. I was just thinking about, because we've been saying a lot about um, it, it's, it has a spiritual or religious feeling and then it gets debunked later mm. on. I just, what's that story uh, that Peter Capaldi did where it's, they're underwater in a ship underwater. Mm-hmm. Is it called the flood or something like that? Um, yeah, um, and, under, under the lake. Something like, yeah. And they, mm. uh, people are killed and there, there are ghosts. And then the, the twist in the story is that they really are ghosts. They're, they're mm. the souls of dead people. I think that's the mm. only time in the series history that that has happened, where the supernatural doesn't get debunked. Mm. Uh, mm. And the, doc, the doctor says, no, they're the real deal. They are the souls of dead people. Yeah, they're ghosts. That that and that is very unusual. I mean, it's, it's something I've been exploring because I'm writing this book about folklore and Scooby Doo at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, in most of Scooby Doo, the supernatural is debunked. But in mm-hmm. certain iterations of the show, it's not. Yeah. You know, thir- Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo is a classic example where where they are demons mm. that are being contained in a chest. And, mm. and they're not the fairground owner with a mask on or whatever. You know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that, that recent the Mystery Inc. Yes, version yes, yeah. Well. Mystery, Mystery Incorporated has 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 that in in um, because it it uses um, again it uses um, conspiracy and UFO law from from more modern times and, and mm-hmm. yeah, there are complications. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Ghosts is interesting actually. They do come up a couple of other occasions don't they um arguably the unquiet dead is kind of about ghosts in a way it's certainly about you know mm. dead bodies being reanimated isn't it mm. zombies and uh, again the, it's another one the ghosts turn out to be aliens they are gaseous mm. they are yeah. gaseous aliens as it turns out in that one yeah and then there's the Sideman story, isn't there, where, where everybody thinks that there are ghosts and Derek Akora proclaims that he's going to be out of business <laughs> because everybody can see spirits for themselves, but then they turn mm. out to not be. That's it, they turn out to be. And uh, although interesting, early on, there's this nice bit where, because Rosie's mother has been convinced it's been her grandfather yeah. uh, coming to, uh, and, and then the doctor says, no, you know, this is just like, He's, you know, and she's he proposes it, and she sort of like says, "Why do you have to spoil it?" You know, she's, <coughs> to, which is not often actually said to him like that. So mm. it was a nice touch that. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, we should wrap up. I think mm-hmm. at this point we've covered a lot of ground, and I suspect that everybody will have a nice long list of episodes that, if they haven't watched them, they should go and watch for <laughs> folkloric interest. So I'm going to I'm going to close off by asking you both to just from everything that we've covered, really, to to pick one story that is of folkloric interest, mythological, legendary interest that is a particular favourite of yours, and and just explain what it is about it that that works well i don't mind who goes first i'll i'll go with the curse of fenric i think okay. um much as i've already said it's that the whole idea of it being a, a viking curse but then some modern technology is used to decipher it mm-hmm. and then they unwittingly unleash this evil that's been kept at bay for thousands of years um, and that the, the evil force has been manipulating mankind up until that point. Uh, but also, this is one of the rare occasions in Doctor Who history where the Doctor already knows. He knows the whole thing before it unfolds, and, and he's got there at exactly the right time and um, is waiting for the right moment to make, to make his move. And, of course, then there's the analogy of the chess game, that he and this evil force... Uh, literally in the in in the episode, but also metaphorically, have been playing chess with one another across the the centuries and millennia. Gareth, what about you? Mm. Uh, we've already talked to, uh, quite a bit about it, but we definitely have to be the demons. Mm-hmm. I think that, from a folkloric point of view, is the richest text by far. We've talked. I mean, this is this recurring theme of science versus uh magic 
it's became we didn't even get onto it. it's got a maypole in it it's yes. morris dancers as well yeah. so we didn't yeah. get into um it's also extremely well written and it's got some very funny stuff we didn't even uh, actually it's got a living gargoyle in it as well oh, yes. uh, yeah. it borrows heavily from sort of like dennis wheatley and that whole kind of uh the devil in an acceptable Saturday tea time way, the whole sort of devil worshipping uh, elements uh, of it, and it's 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 a very rich text, and uh, and even by the end of it, even the doctor has to admit, you know, he doesn't know all the answers. It ends with the doctor saying, "You were right, Joe. There's magic in the world after all." Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and what a great close that is. And I think I would go with that one for the same reasons as well. Yes, it, it's got the it's it's got the Maypole and the Morris dancing mm-hmm. and the very traditional kind of English custom about it. It it mm-hmm. has what my friend Howard David Ingham would refer to as the pagan village conspiracy. Um <laughs> and and yes, the the whole kind of magical aspect of it, I think. Um We'll, we'll probably set that one out for me. That's one that I would recommend that people go and watch. Thank you both so much for taking the time to to run through this. It's been really interesting to revisit some of these old stories, actually, in, from the far corners of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> if, people, if people want to go and seek out more of your own work, where should they go and look for it? Will, where can people find what you do? Well, I've got my own website, willhadcroft.com, and I've got, obviously, my, my latest work is... Uh, Doctor Who, The Resurrection Plant, which is a, an audio story, prose, read by Fraser Hines, with a few sound effects and bits of incidental music by David uh, Rucroft. Yeah, so that's that's got a little bit of folklore stuff going on. There's a gestalt creature in that, a composite mind. I will say no more than that, so mm-hmm. that I don't spoil it for people. But Definitely it's The Resurrection not. Plant, and it's on Amazon and all the usual places. Excellent. And Gareth, where would people go and find your work? Well, the best place to start would be garethpreston.blog, which is my blog, and that has links to all the things I'm involved in and some ghosts and some horror do creep in there. And meanwhile, Very British Futures, the podcast, is available on most major podcast stations. And it's excellent listening too. It is indeed. Uh, and both Gareth and Will can be easily found on Twitter as well. That being yeah. a place where you can converse with them both as well as me. Uh, Gareth, indeed. Will, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been great. Gareth, Will and I had a lot of fun chatting through the episodes of Doctor Who and I'm grateful to them both for the opportunity. You can follow both of them on Twitter at Gaz Hack and Will Hadcroft respectively and I'll put links in the show notes and on the episode page on the website. The Folklore Podcast is the official podcast of the Folklore Library and Archive, which you can find online at www.folklorelibrary.com. Our aim is to preserve and make available for the future folklore resources in all formats, audio, visual, print and physical artefacts. To help us to achieve our goal, please consider supporting our work by either joining the Folklore Podcast Patreon family at patreon.com slash thefolklorepodcast where you can access extra materials or visit the Library and Archive website. You can learn more about our work, browse our materials and if what you find there is useful and worthwhile you can make a donation on our fundraising page. Thank you for helping us to save folklore material for the future. See you next time.